but I call them false allies because there were ways and means by which even the Maharajas actually resisted colonial uh, influence. The British also overstated the kind of influence they had over the Maharajas. In reality, although the British clipped their wings when it came to foreign policy and defense, internally the Maharajas had a lot of power. They had access to money, which they were able to channel into the Congress party. They were able to meet, some of them met with revolutionaries, some of them funded propaganda against the British Raj, and often they would even slight the British on ritual terms. You know, they would have these very interesting contests with the British, where ritual became a means of doing politics. Well, for the simple reason that 40% of the Indian subcontinent, even under the Raj, was actually under the princely states. Yeah. And the word that we often use is indirect rule, but what that eclipses is that these states or that 40% of India was under Indian rule. There were Indian Rajas with Indian ministers, with Indian bureaucrats ruling over fellow Indians. So although there was colonialism, the experience of colonialism in that 40% segment of India was actually very different from what was happening in British India, because the white man wasn't a direct sort of presence in the princely states. Um, my grandmother grew up in the princely state of Travancore. And, you know, they had no political figure higher than the Maharaja. They knew there was the Englishman somewhere outside. They knew about Gandhiji. But beyond that, it was the Maharaja's government that sent them their milk powder to the government school. There was a government school in the village. Uh, there were medical facilities. There were midwives coming for, for, for birth in the 40s and so on. It was pretty well developed for that time. But... What is the general stereotype we've got? That, you know, this 40%, there were these Rajas, they lived in these grand palaces. Early in the morning, they'd wake up, they'd oppress their subjects for breakfast. Then they'd watch dancing girls for the rest of the time. And in the evening, they'd get together with the British, drink and say, hmm, how do we keep the British Empire going for longer? They were allies of the, of the British Empire. That's the conventional idea. But I call them false allies because there were ways and means by which even the Maharajas actually resisted colonial uh, influence. The British also overstated the kind of influence they had over the Maharajas. In reality, although the British clipped their wings when it came to foreign policy and defense, internally the Maharajas had a lot of power. They had access to money, which they were able to channel into the Congress party. They were able to meet, some of them met with revolutionaries, some of them funded propaganda against the British Raj, and often they would even slight the British on ritual terms. You know, they would have these very interesting contests with the British, where ritual became a means of doing politics. Uh, a lot of them, in fact, you know, even contemporary issues of identity, communalism, caste, communal violence in India was higher in British India and lower in the Hindu princely states. Even though the Rajas were officially custodians of Hinduism, you would imagine they were very orthodox. Yet Ian Copeland, the scholar, has shown that communal violence was lower in the princely states. So even in, in, in the 21st century, when we talk of modern Indian history, we can't exclude the 40% that was in British India. We can't exclude these aspects of communalism, caste, how colonialism worked out in the princely states. And if a, cl a cliche or a stereotype exists about dancing girls and elephants and, and people being oppressed you know, five times a day, I think the our intention should be to question the cliche, find out the source of the origin of that stereotype, and then look at the princely states from a new perspective. By no means am I saying the princely states were good or bad. It was just that they are politically interesting, and the Rajas didn't just wear silks and sit about uh, all day long. They were also political actors, and if they rode elephants, if they wore those silks and jewels, everything also had political meaning. It wasn't devoid of political meaning. If you've enjoyed the conversation that you just heard, do subscribe to our channel for much more.